Do you have the login for the Zoom over there? The computer to restart it and log out for the next room over. Next room over? Yeah. Uh, two, nine? I believe so. Because we, uh, we have the URL, but do you have like a specific login for it? That's how we log in. It's just that. Just the, the meeting ID, and you type in the. the Ready, Raven? Yeah, I'm all right. Okay, so I am Megan Biller. I am um, part of the Hatch Planning team. And so today I would like to introduce Raven Hills, who will be talking about the Anti Violence Alliance Peer Education Program. Yes, <laughs> sort of, kind of. I know not everyone has a peer education program. Um, sound okay on Zoom? I think so. Okay. The Let's mic's see. right there. So that's the mic? Yep. That's the mic. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so I would like to start my presentation with just some quick ground rules group agreements just so we're all on the same page. Um, I do this with my students. I encourage my students to do this in their presentations as well. Um, so first and foremost, take care of yourself. So that just means do whatever you need to do to feel comfortable in this space. Take a break, stand up, stretch, walk around, um, get some water, whatever you need. Uh, you won't be you won't be bothering me. Do what you need to do. Um, I know there's time at the end for questions, but I don't mind being interrupted throughout if you want to pause um, and ask me questions. There's kind of like two specific sections in this presentation. So I'll pause for some questions after the first half and then we'll get into the second part. Um, my Zoom participants, I am notorious for speaking fast um, and forgetting in a hybrid setting that there are people on Zoom who have trouble hearing me. So tell me to slow down um, or ask me to repeat myself if someone on Zoom can't hear me. And then if you have any questions or concerns about this presentation afterwards, feel free to email me. Email's on the screen and I'll have it on the last slide as well. Sorry, it's not sure. Hold on. We're good. Okay. All right, so quick overview of what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to briefly explain the ADA, the Anti-Violence Alliance, and the Peer Educator Program just to kind of ground us in where I'm coming from with this work. I'm going to take us through the six learning domains um, that I use in my program, and then we'll talk about how you can apply those learning domains to your work with students and however that shows up. Are we okay? Um, no. Nope. <laughs> Oh, I think it's, it must be a good place. One second, sorry. No, you're good. I think it's because it's open. This one, do you want to do that one or do you want to do that one? Oh. Yep, we're good now. Okay. That's okay. Let me see. Hold on. Now it's not going forward. Here we hold on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do we hold the joystick through? Oh. You go. Yep. There you go. Is that me? Okay, perfect. All right. So agenda, uh, ABA peer educator program, learning domains, and then how to apply it. And then this um, fancy thing I call the self, the student employee learning plan that I use with my students as well. Okay, so <clears throat> quick overview. The ABA, the Anti-Violence Alliance, I'll refer to it as the ABA. Um, we are a prevention education and awareness group on campus. So we're a bunch of faculty, staff, and students who are working to change our broader campus culture around interpersonal violence. 
So dating, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. How do we recognize it? How do we prevent it? How do we respond to it? Um, if you want more information about the work that we do, we have our own website. It's not part of the Ferris website, but it's an external site, fsuantiviolence.org. Um, and then the peer educator program in particular, so these are the students that make up the ABA. It is a paid position, so it is a job on campus. However, very irregular hours. It's not like a typical student employee job where they come in, set schedule, set amount of time during the week. Um, partly that is it's by design. I wanted it that way because some of the work that we do require students to do things at, at night, you know, when they're practicing over the weekend when I'm not necessarily in the office and I want to make sure that they get paid for those hours. And then two, our work heavily falls under the different awareness months throughout the calendar year. So there are four main awareness months covering the topics that we talked about. So in October, we have domestic violence awareness month. January is stalking awareness month. February is teen dating violence awareness month. And then April is sexual assault awareness month. So in between those months, the hours de decrease because we're not doing as many um, workshops, excuse me, and trainings on campus. The students receive very specialized training and comprehensive training in the program. Um, I don't require them to know anything prior to joining the work or the movement. Um, so we do a lot of training in the fall after we do our recruiting um, to get them basically up to speed and kind of everyone have the same foundational level of knowledge about all of the dynamics involved um, in interpersonal violence. And then generally throughout the year, they host awareness and prevention workshops and then bystander intervention. So bystander intervention. Uh, you see something happening, how do you intervene to help um, prevent harm from happening to someone else? Uh, like I said, students are not required to know anything before joining. Many of them come to this work for specific reasons. So many of them have an interest in public health, criminal justice, social work, or interpersonal violence prevention and intervention, meaning these are things that they're either majoring in right now or have a desire to work in this career field down the road. Not true of all of them, but generally speaking, that's who this program tends to attract. And then for me, the position is important because it teaches so many useful skills for professional development. Even if someone is not going to do prevention or intervention work after working in this program, they're gaining skills around public speaking, facilitating programs, creating content, um, et cetera. So we'll talk about all of that as we go forward. Okay, so NASPA, NPES, I haven't found a fun way to say NPES, so it just says NPES. So NASPA is the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators, and the NPES is this National Peer Educator Survey. So this has been around since about 2004. It's really designed um, to create an evidence base for professionals who, hold, who facilitate peer educator programs to justify and provide some rationale for why a peer educator program is beneficial for students. Kind of in terms of how do we recruit peer educators because it's a difficult role um, no matter what your your peer educators are presenting about um, so the the point behind the survey is to, to help you as a facilitator attract students to your program so it covers um it it investigates self-reported motivations for peer educators so why did someone why was someone attracted to being a peer educator and then it tracks some changing trends in membership of peer educators across the country. This part is helpful um, just in terms of noticing things such as tends to be more upperclassmen who get involved in peer educator programs. So not so many freshmen and sophomores. I see a lot of juniors and seniors um, wanting to be peer educators after they've grown a little bit in their career field and their educational field. Um, and then it tracks some important demographic information. So specifically with the work that the ABA does, Historically, it has been spearheaded, heralded by cishet white women. And so they've seen that changing trend in the peer educator membership that it, in the past, it generally attracted young, white, heterosexual women into peer educator programs. And over time, they've seen an increase in BIPOC students becoming involved, LGBTQ students being involved, which makes our movement and our work better and more comprehensive. But the main thing we're talking about today are the six self-reported learning domains for peer educators. So the survey asks a series of questions um, to peer educators who complete the survey every year about the things that they gain from the, uh, being a peer educator in whatever program that they're in. So the six are, and we're going to go through all of these, <clears throat> practical competence, cognitive complexity, 
intrapersonal development, interpersonal development, knowledge acquisition, construction, integration, and application, and then humanitarianism and civic engagement. If you're interested, that citation um, is the latest NPES that exists right now. You can get a new one every year. Um, pretty much changes the graphics and then updated statistical information. Okay, so why should you care about the learning domain, especially if you don't actually work with peer educators? Um, basically, I use it as a way to shape the work that you do with students um, to provide a bunch of different expectations. So one, clear expectations for your students. What am I expecting you to do in this program or in your work with me? And then what are you, what can you expect as a student to get out of this work? So how does it benefit me? How does it benefit you? Um, for you as a facilitator, having confidence in your students' ability to do the work without a lot of oversight. Um, so like I said, in our program, my students are often doing work and on uh, like, you know, at 11 o'clock at night on the weekends when I'm not sitting there over their shoulder looking at what they're doing. So having some trust for myself that they're doing what I've asked them to do and that the quality of their work they're producing is up to my standard. Um, and then in general, when you're working with students too, we don't always have time to sit there and monitor exactly what our students are doing. We want them to have a little bit of independence in the work that they create. Um, like I said earlier, it provides professional development skills to aid in their future careers, whatever those careers may be, doesn't necessarily have to be tied to the specific work they're doing as a peer ed or in your student work with them. Um, it's a great way to develop leadership skills. Um, I'll kind of talk about how I scaffold the peer educator program in general to um, have some role expansion for students, students who want to get more involved. And then it's a good way to hold yourself accountable to developing and mentoring skills in your students. So it's really helpful for me to make sure, am I doing what I told them I would do um, by having very specific metrics for myself as a check to make sure that they're not just sitting there kind of doing busy work, not getting a lot out of the work. Okay, so we're gonna go through the learning domains. I'll define what they are and then have some ideas for how you can cultivate them in your own work. So practical competence, generally speaking, just can you do what I've asked you to do? So being effective in whatever role that they have, developing a sense of self and purpose so they are understanding why they're doing this work, it, um, it intrinsic motivation for them to do the work, and then having the knowledge and skills necessary to work independently so they're not having to constantly ask you um, for support and assistance. So some ways to cultivate it. One, comprehensive training is really, really important. Getting everybody that basic, same level foundational piece of information on how they are going to do the role that you're asking them to do. I always like to do refresher training at the start of every school year. So this is especially important when you're working with students year after year. They're coming back after summer break, uh, making sure, let's see, we haven't forgotten anything or there's been new developments in the field and I wanna make sure everybody has the, the latest and most updated information. We often in, uh, interweave current events as well, the things that have happened recently, how does that impact our work? How does that impact what we're doing? Um, doing ongoing professional development, so not this kind of one and done, you were trained and now you're good to go. But again, weaving in those current events, weaving in uh, new research, new data in our work and how we do our work to benefit everybody in terms of doing our work a little bit better. And then role specific skill development. So for us in the ABA, that is often around facilitating presentations and then creating content for awareness month. So individual unique presentations that our students come up with, um, have helping them kind of this iterative, iterative approach of student has an idea for a presentation, they start working on an outline, they work with me to figure out, okay, what am I missing? What are some pieces that I wanna make sure that I touch on? working on the presentation, and then back to me, feedback, edits, feedback, et cetera, until they're ready to present. All right, cognitive complexity. <clears throat> so this is about reflecting on your previous experiences and using what you've learned to apply to new situations. Um, it also includes <clears throat> development of critical thinking and problem solving skills. Again, kind of tying, back, tying that back into being able to work independently when your supervisor is not around. So I believe very strongly in self-reflection for uh, developing cognitive complexity in my students. So I want them to tell me, what are you able to recognize in yourself of some strengths that you have and some areas where you might want to develop some more skills that I can help you with? And then using feedback 
So when we do presentations, I ask the students, tell me what went really well. Tell me what went, didn't go so great. Was there anything that happened that you were like, I had no idea how to handle this situation. Someone asked me a question. I didn't know if my answer was right. Um, and then we can talk about that so that the next time that question comes up or the next time a similar situation happens, they feel a little bit more prepared to answer it, more confident in how they're going to respond. And then <clears throat> challenging any assumptions about the work itself. So this, this applies very specifically to the ABA a lot, but students come with a lot of myths and misconceptions about interpersonal violence. So I'll ask them questions about why does sexual assault happen? Why do people abuse their partner? What does that look like? So that I can understand where are they coming from and then how can I do some training to myth bust a little bit um, and get them all to the place where they are understanding where these myths and misconceptions come from so that when someone in their audience repeats the same kind of myth or misconception that they previously had, they now have an understanding of how to unpack that and retrain, unlearn um, some of that same information with other students. All right, so intrapersonal development. Um, <clears throat> this is self-awareness and about setting personal goals, understanding how values differ between different people, and then recognizing personal attributes that you have. So what are some things that you are already really good at? So the way that I cultivate this in my students is doing some very specific and intensive intersectionality and implicit bias training. So like I said, our movement in prevention was spearheaded and started by cis hat white women. So where, what, who's left out of that narrative? What voices are we not hearing from? What impacts are we not considering um, in our work when we only come at it from that frame of reference? How do your different identities as peer educators impact the way you interact with students? Um, <clears throat> how does that, we talk about that a lot in our bystander intervention curriculum. How do uh, your unique identities interact or influence the way that you might intervene in a particular um, the importance of working with an inclusive group of students. So I use inclusive here very deliberately. Oftentimes you'll hear, um, you know, I want to work with a diverse group of students. And for me, that term diverse group means, do we have a certain number of non-white faces in our space that make us feel comfortable that we have recruited enough people to fulfill some sort of imaginary quota um, to say that we are representative of, this, of the university? And for me, I want to take it a step further than that. It's not just about having a certain number of non-white faces in my group. It's about how do we make sure that the people in my group feel supported, feel that their voices are heard, feel that their experiences are reflected in the way that we talk about our work, are reflected in the scenarios that we use, are reflected in the training content that I provide them. Um, so that's, again, one of that. Uh, it's important for you as a facilitator to be thinking about how do I make um, a person who does not has not historically seen themselves represented in this work feel like they belong and feel like they have a voice to share um, with the rest of our program? Um, the importance of learning to recognize personal limits and setting boundaries. Uh, also understanding the importance of self-care. So I do this with a lot, this modeling authenticity part at the, at the end. It kind of ties into all three of those. So, just in general, being a college student, your work fluctuates, right? It's like during midterms, everyone's super stressed out. Everyone's like, I have no time to do anything right now. Okay, that is fine. I anticipate that. I expect that to be something that's happening to you. The fact that you can communicate that to me so that I know kind of, okay, this week we need to slow down the work a little bit. Next week will be a little bit different. Um, and modeling that for myself as a facilitator. So if I don't know something, if I don't know the answer to something, if I'm having a bad day, I didn't sleep well, and I'm cranky, um, and I'm not feeling my best, telling that to my students. So they're, under, they're understanding that it's okay to have a bad day. It's okay to not be 100% all of the time. And then hopefully that they'll feel more comfortable also having those moments where they're like, I'm not at my best today. I'm not going to be giving you the, the best work. Um, so having, having, giving them that ability to recognize when they need to take a break, especially. This, for me, feels more important when you're doing work that is um, very deeply personal to a lot of these students. I assume, I never ask, but I assume that many of my students come to this work because they themselves are survivors. Um, and so something that we talk about in prevention work is that eventually you will hear, if you are a survivor yourself, you will hear your story reflected back to you from somebody else. And dealing with that can be really challenging. 
So providing my students space to understand that one, that might happen, and two, it's okay to have a reaction that you weren't expecting, um, and that I am going to give you some space, give you some time to regroup, come back later, um, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Okay, and then interpersonal development. So how do we work with other people? Um, important here too is, is thinking about how do we achieve mutual goals of people who are very different from us. So again, in prevention work specifically, thinking about the fact that many people don't understand the need for to be involved in prevention work. This doesn't affect me. This is not an issue that I have to deal with. Um, so I'm not, I don't need to come to a program or I don't need to think about these things in my own life. So how can we talk about what the work that we do that will encourage other people to get involved in what we do? So whatever that field looks like for you, whatever your, the nature of your work is with students, how can you talk about your work with other departments across campus, with other um, faculty members or other student groups that you can work collaboratively together? And then uh, importance of engaging in active listening and effective communication with others. So understanding a bit about your own communication style, um, <clears throat> the way you like to talk with people, the way you like people to talk with you, and then those leadership skills that I talked about earlier. So cultivating it, big fan of collaboration, especially collaborating with different departments. The beauty of having a group of students from across the campus is that they're all involved in different RSOs, different clubs, different departments, different career fields, um, and they will likely have ideas about how your work can tie into the other areas that they're involved with. So encouraging that collaborative nature and spirit around your work to say, okay, you're in, um, you're in pharmacy. How can we tie our work to something that would be important for students in the pharmacy department? Um, and then working on creating that content together so that they, they learn about Again, talking with other people about the work that they do, creating content, facilitating things, and then working collaboratively with another department. Um, just by nature of doing kind of intensive work like this, students do tend to take on leadership roles within a campus community. In my experience with peer educator programs, they tend to attract the students who are like heavily involved in all of the things, the ones who are already leaders um, and do important work on campus or wherever they are. And this helps, again, kind of boost up those leadership skills. And then teaching effective conflict management. So when something, you have a bad day, or when something goes wrong when you're at work, um, how can you manage that? When you're presenting and something goes wrong, when you're presenting and someone is disruptive or combative, not willing to listen to the message that you have, how can you handle those situations? Okay, long one. Knowledge, acquisition, construction, integration, and application kind of uh, defined within the name itself, but for some specifics, thinking about how do you know that your students are aware of all the resources and supports that go along with whatever role you're asking them to do um, on campus, whether that is something as simple as where are, you know, how to make copies in the office to how do you connect someone to really tangible supports that they need for their academic or uh, mental health. Um, and then being able to synthesize that existing knowledge and applying it to novel situations. And then evaluating that information and the subsequent conclusions that you draw. So how do I know that what I have decided to do is the best option in this situation? Um, is there another way to do it? Um, and then how can I teach other people about that as well? And then of course, as I was saying, the ability to perform your work functions independently so you're not having to constantly manage. Uh, the kind of nitty gritty details of what they're doing. So another form of self-reflection for me is the sharing collectively of information. So I like to have my students share best practices and lessons learned with each other. So if someone was at a presentation and X, Y, and Z happened, let's talk about that as a group. Here's what happened. Here's what I did. Anyone have ideas for how I could have done things differently or how I could have changed my response? Um, and then having the students kind of work together to figure out what a better reaction would have been, what something to do differently, or like, hey, you did a great job, I would have done the exact same thing. Um, I like to have my students conduct research into a specific area of interest. So what is something related to our work that really like gets you going, that you are super excited about, that you wanna learn more about? Do some of that research and share it back to us to help with all of our professional development. Um, kind of was going along with the, in the first, the practical confidence one about ongoing professional development. So I like to provide additional training 
on related topics to the role. So for instance, yes, I need you to understand the dynamics of dating, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking, but I also need you to feel comfortable presenting. So how can we talk about facilitation best practices or public speaking or how to create a PowerPoint presentation so that it's not super distracting um, and that you remember all the points that you want to make that sort of a thing. And then this making connections between their classwork work and current events. So drawing in outside information, applying that to the work that they do um, and synthesizing all of that to say, this is something that's happening in another field, in another area. How could we apply it to our work? Or this happened, I saw this on the news last night, and it made me think, like, why are we talking about this particular thing in this way? Um, so encouraging them to bring that outside information in. And then humanitarianism and civic engagement. So just thinking about other people beyond the scope of your work. And then being able to talk with people who are different from you. So people that you might not have a class with, but you have to work with. Um, or people who have very different beliefs from you, but you have to present in front of um, or interact with at the help desk, you know, that sort of thing. And then this integration into the campus community. One of the biggest things that I have in the back of my mind all the time when working with peer educators is that it's a huge point of retention for students. So when they feel like they have a group on campus that feels important to them, they have that intrinsic motivation to make a difference, they're more likely to stick around because they want to continue that work. Um, and for some of the students, it provides them that sort of niche area that forms part of their identity as a student at Ferris. So they, uh, they graduate and they're like, I was a peer educator with the Anti-Violence Alliance. Maybe I didn't do a whole lot else, but maybe that was the most important thing that I had for my time here. It, it provided me a group of friends, it gave me professional development skills, and I felt like I did something important um, for the Ferris community while I was here. So cultivating that, um, simply doing things like working within the local community. So figuring out where are there other departments or organizations within Big Rapids or Grand Rapids that I can work with and have my students connect with to make that broader, that work broader than just our, um, our little bubble here. Um, <clears throat> we do a lot of work on how do we provide tailored programming to students with marginalized identities and investigating whose voices are missing from our work. So in doing the type of work that we do, who are we not hearing from? Who are we missing in terms of input, input perspective, um, or collaboration? So where can we where can we broaden our work beyond just ourselves? Okay, so this is where I'm going to pause before we talk about the student employee learning plan. So those are the six learning domains. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end, but if anything pops up anyone now, go ahead and ask. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. All right, so the SELF, the Student Employee Learning Plan, this is how I take those six learning domains and then put them into um, a tangible kind of like tracking mechanism. So how do I make sure that I'm touching on all of those learning domains and the way that I form the program? So this is a written document. Um, it's very self-reflective. Like I said, I like self-reflection as a form of figuring things out for yourself. The, the specific questions can be tailored to whatever program that you're doing. So I'm going to take you through, excuse me, the questions that I ask that are tied very heavily to the work that I do, but it's totally adaptable. Um, just kind of thinking about what sort of things you need from your students uh, that you work with. The benefit of it is that they can complete it year after year. So it helps you and it helps them see how their answers change over time as they learn more information, as they grow as humans. Um, so I really like to track kind of how things change. And then it can help you, just for me, this is helpful, just practical information. So when do my students have class? When do they have other jobs that they're a part of? What other RSOs are they participating in? So that I can make sure, okay, everybody has a class um, at one o'clock on Tuesdays. We're not gonna schedule anything at one o'clock on Tuesdays because no one's gonna be available. So just kind of those practical logistical pieces. Um, and then, like I said, the goal is to apply each of the learning domains to a set of self-reflective questions. And then I, what I do is I have the students fill that out. 
And then I sit down and I review it with them so that we can talk about what exactly are you wanting to get out of this year in the program so that I can make sure I'm holding myself accountable to making sure that you get that. Okay, so this first part, um, this is taken from the Student Employee Learning Plan from GDSU. It's just a basic self-assessment of employable qualities. So things that um, employers want in someone just out of college, first job, skills that they hope that they have. Um, it's just a four point Likert scale. So not confident, fairly confident, confident, and very confident on these different, um, different areas. So like I said, I use this information to really frame the way that I do this work with students. So my first year at Ferris doing this, um, so this was fall of 2020, summer after Black Lives Matter protests across the nation. And most of my students were rating cultural sensitivity and awareness as a one or a two. So my students were not feeling very confident about their own level of cultural sensitivity and awareness. So this told me a couple of things. One, they're paying attention to what is going on in their world beyond Ferris. Two, they're thinking and doing some reflecting about their own gaps in knowledge and where they could do better. And three, it's telling me I have a great opportunity to do some really intensive work on cultural humility with this group of students. They're ready for it. They're primed for understanding and unpacking. Where have I had um, beliefs that were not okay? What am I missing in terms of my knowledge base? So that helped me decide, okay, we're going to talk about some pretty difficult stuff in our training, specifically the way that interpersonal violence shows up in minority, in minority communities um, and why that has not been part of the conversation historically. So it was very helpful for me for that. Second part, this technology and computer literacy, this one was super surprising to me because I assumed Gen Z, um, they're probably better at technology than I feel. However, they were again reading themselves as ones or twos. Um, and this was largely in part because most of our programs in 2020, the 2020 21 school year, were on Zoom. So they were telling me, I do not feel comfortable presenting on Zoom. I don't understand the functions. So we did some very specific trainings on here are some facilitation best practices for when you're on Zoom. Here are the functions, here are the features. Here's how we can change the way that we typically would have presented this face to face for a Zoom envi environment. So it gives you as facilitator some like uh, very specific points to touch on in your training. Okay, so then I have a section for just generally what are your career and professional goals. So this changes um, a lot for students over time. So the areas for improvement, I tie it back to this part. Um, so what are the employable qualities that you are not rating yourself super great on um, that you want to improve? What do you currently do really well? Or what are some skills that you already have? And then how could you use those skills to improve those specific areas up above? So I tend to get a lot of questions around, I am very, very organized. Great. How can we use your organizational skills to help you think through how to present on Zoom? So what does that look like, your prep work for a presentation on Zoom because you are really good at organization? And then these two questions, the last two, where do you want to go and how will you get there? I leave vague on purpose um, because I want to see how the student interprets that question. My uh, underclassmen tend to say things more um, either where they want to go within the program itself that year. So I want to facilitate a program by the end of the year. Great. I know that that's what we're working towards with that student. Um, my underclassmen will also do kind of a broad, vague uh, career goals. So I want to work in social work. I want to do something in social work. Um, and so that, again, that's telling me, okay, so this is kind of what they're thinking. And then I can work with them more specifically to figure out what area of social work are you really interested in? And then my upperclassmen uh, tend to have much more specific, I want to go to this program on this part of the country so that I can do this, so that I can do this job. Um, so it tends to get more specific as they get older, um, but still helpful for you as a facilitator. Um, understanding what skills and things you can help them with. Okay, so then this is how I apply the learning domains to the self that I do with my students. So for practical competence, for me, that just means can you present um, effectively as a peer educator? And can you craft a presentation from scratch? So a lot of my students have uh, individual ideas about what to do for uh, workshops and trainings with other students. So are you able to do that? Do I have confidence that you are able to take the training 
um, and create a presentation that is trauma-informed, survivor-centered, and intersectional. So some sample questions. What makes an effective presenter? How are you already an effective presenter? And where would you like to improve your presenting skills? Some of this I pick up myself when I see them present. So one that comes up a lot, um, people who talk fast like me, like I am a fast talker when I present. I have a lot of students who are fast talkers when they present. So we talk about strategies for slowing that down a little bit. Um, I have some students who are very uncomfortable presenting without a script. So they want a piece of paper in front of them that they can read from so that they don't get sidetracked. Okay, not great for presenting in front of a lot of people. So how can we work to make you feel a little bit more comfortable? How can we change the slide um, so that you can have some skills to develop that confidence in being able to speak kind of off the cuff in your presentations? Okay, for cognitive complexity, I'm tracking it with um, mostly via self-report. So are you able to synthesize information from training to problem solve independently? So this is where some of that myth busting comes in. So when they're in a, pr a presentation with someone or a group of students and someone says something that's victim blaming, or someone says something that is, you know, um, you know, something like alcoholism is the cause of domestic violence. From our training, I would expect that my peer educators would be able to understand why that is an incorrect assumption to make, and then what to say to help that person understand that that's not actually what's going on um, in interpersonal violence. So this is where the question, the self-reflective questions after presentations are really key. So what questions came up during the presentation? How did you handle them? Um, and then we can talk about, okay, don't forget to say this part, or like you did a really great job with that. That's a really creative way to answer that question or deal with that, um, that situation that came up. And so for the self, I want to know what is their personal problem solving style? So how do they typically like to go about um, solving problems? I am very much an extrovert, so I word vomit. I need to talk it out to understand what is going on. Some of my students are more introverted, so they're, they're saying, I need some time to like quietly process to myself before we talk about it. Great, that helps me know so that I'm not overwhelming someone who's like, you are throwing way too much information at me right now, and I need a minute <laughs> to think this through. Um, and then thinking about how they like to think through issues. So again, here myself, I'm much more uh, the critical analyzer for problems, but I have a lot of students who think really creatively about how to solve problems and how to handle situations. So hearing both sides of that, hearing both perspectives of that in our meetings um, is helpful for everybody to think some, of, of some different ways of handling questions or problems that come up. All right, for intrapersonal development, um, I do check grades for my students. So we have a, um, a minimum GPA requirement. For me, it is student employees. So the student part comes first. It is the most important part. So I want to make sure that they are succeeding academically beyond the program before they get into the nitty gritty work itself. Um, and so if I have a student who is struggling academically, that then becomes a conversation of not, this program is no longer open for you, but how can we work together to get your academics back on track? What's been going on for you? Um, what are some supports that you didn't know existed on campus? How can I help connect you to those resources? So really thinking about what do you need to succeed academically first so that then we can do some of the work um, in the peer ed program. So my policy is very much about like holistic wraparound care for this. Uh, I'm never gonna kick somebody out for not having great high enough grades. Um, we're just gonna work more individually one-on-one -on -one to figure out what we can do to support. Individual check-ins. So individual check-ins are mandatory for anybody who's on an academic improvement plan. So we'll meet weekly to talk about what's going on for you in your classes, what's going on in your personal life, how are you handling things, how can I support, et cetera. Um, and then I leave myself open for individual check-ins at any time for anybody else. So using this time as for someone to say, you know, I am just having some personal things come up in my life right now. I think I need to take a step back from my role. Okay, do we want to talk about it more? How can I be supportive when you're ready to come back? Let's talk about it. Normalizing those conversations so that they're not, I have, it's always kind of not funny, but um, I don't know, I don't know the word, funny, I'll just use that for right now. Um, but sometimes I'll have students come and they're like, they feel a lot of shame around wanting to take a step back or feeling like they can't do the work anymore. Um, 
So it's a conversation around like it's okay, it's normal. I expect that that's going to happen for you at some point in this in the school year. So it's fine that you're taking a step back, and thank you for recognizing that you need a break before things became um, a crisis. So normalizing those conversations. Um, and then I also like to see if anyone is is completing those independent projects. So is there a specific area that they want to learn more about? Are they like I really want to? Um, create my own content. So one of the things that we had a student do, they're really interested in the way pop culture portrays healthy and unhealthy relationship dynamics, mostly unhealthy relationship dynamics presented as healthy relationship dynamics. And so he's created an entire series where they tie pop culture, um, pop culture references to specific aspects about interpersonal violence and then unpacks how that's harmful um, for survivors and then just for, in general, you're learning about relationships. So sample questions, what's something you'd like to accomplish this year? So I try to get a little specific about this, especially for returning peer educators. So last year, you said that you wanted to create your own program content. This year, what do you want to do? Do you want to do more program content? Do you want to train another peer educator on how to present something? So getting really specific on a personal goal. And then finding out from them, do you prefer to write or to speak when you communicate with someone? Um, so this is helpful for my peer eds, especially the ones on academic improvement plans, who will tell me, you know, I'm struggling academically. It doesn't help me to get 20 emails a day from someone. I'd rather have a Zoom chat or come to your office and talk through what I need to get done that week. Great. Then I know, like, note, like, note to myself, um, don't send a student an email or five emails in a day. Wait to have that meeting and talk to them through it in person. And then asking them, when do they know that they're starting to feel overwhelmed or stressed? So what are some clues for yourself? Because they change for everybody. Um, that you are starting to get to the crisis point where you're like, I need something to stop or I'm going to go over the edge. Um, so learning and starting that process of recognizing how these things show up for them internally. For interpersonal development, um, big fan of role expansion. I love nothing more than when a student is like, this is what I thought I was going to do as a peer educator, and I would like to do these 20 other things. Perfect. Let's talk about how we can get that done. Um, and then it gives me ideas for like, okay, all of my peer educators are really wanting to do, for instance, what has come up recently is um, our social media stuff. I don't do social media, not my thing. They love it. They want to do a whole bunch of work with it. Great. Let's take it and run with it. Social media is now a committee on our peer ed team. Um, and then leadership responsibilities. So when I was talking earlier about the way I scaffold the program, we have different roles within the ABA based on students' personal preferences, interests, skills, et cetera. So my students who are super, super, super shy, not ready to do presenting, like public speaking is like, I am not doing that. Um, we have just the social media committee. So you can just work on social media. You can just do behind the scenes stuff. You can be that third facilitator in a program that helps with tracking attendance, making sure that the presentation is pulled up correctly. Um, so that third, that third facilitator role, how does that work for you? Then we have our regular peer educators who are doing the workshop facilitations and presentations. And then we have two leadership responsibilities or two leadership roles within the program as well. So a staff assistant and a staff lead. Those two folks um, have more hours, so more regular hours, they tend to want to work in person in the office. Um, and they're kind of like my right hand folks. So they do a lot more of the actual program content. They role model for the rest of the peer educator group in terms of, um, you know, this is what our expectations are. Hey, I need someone to sign up for a program facilitation. I need someone to sign up for a tingling event. So they help me a lot with um, some of the logistical pieces of our work because we don't have administrative support. Um, so some sample questions for this. What traits do you value in a leader? Helpful for me to know, okay, if they're like, most of my students are things like honesty, transparency, um, kindness. Okay, cool. I know that that's what they expect from me as a leader of this program. So I'm going to make sure that I am modeling that as well. Part of that modeling authenticity piece. And then how do you as a student demonstrate leadership skills? So knowing the things that you like about a leader, where are you already like doing some really good work? Um, and where else would you like to collaborate? So this is that piece around mutual goals with different uh, departments. So if you're part of a certain RSO, 
do you see a clear way where our work and their work might intersect that we could improve our program overall by working with another group on campus? We've got five minutes. Perfect. Um, all right, so for knowledge acquisition, construction, integration, and application. So this is where that independent research comes into play. So a student who is like, um, I'm really interested. We had a student who wanted to do how does IPV specifically show up in the Black community, unpacking a lot of myths there. So doing some specific research and then creating a program that is dedicated to that topic overall. And then the self-report of handling difficult questions during presentation. So again, that self-reflective piece of um, this question came up during the presentation. Here's how I handled it. Yay, nay, let's change it this way next time. Um, so again, that question, what's an area of specific interest that you'd like to research? Why is it important to you? And then what is your plan for disseminating that information with the rest of the group? So do you want to do uh, a workshop or a training for the peer educators about the topics that you learned about? Do you want to synthesize this into a presentation that you create yourself for the broader campus community? That sort of a thing. And then finally, the humanitarianism and civic engagement piece. Um, the biggest one that I look at is the consideration of intersectionality and content creation. Um, <clears throat> so when I see students making a conscious, deliberate choice around including intersectional pieces, so different examples and scenarios, um, inclusivity in the imagery that they choose for their presentation, that's when that's telling me, okay, they've gotten it. They're understanding how to incorporate intersectionality into their work. And then any sort of role expansion beyond the Harris community. So yes, this is important on our campus community, but these issues affect everybody. So how can we expand our work to touch um, more lives beyond just the Big Rapids campus? So then I ask them to think about a time when someone's values differed from them and then how their values have changed over time. So tracking some of that growth for them um, <clears throat> around this is where I was when I was a freshman. This is where I am now as a senior or from high school to college. There's a big, tends to be that big like uh, maturity growth that happens between uh, the end of start and end of freshman, freshman year. Um, and then investigating when someone's values differed from them. So how can you have conversations with people who really don't agree with what you're talking about or are having a hard time understanding where you're coming from? Um, can you reflect on a time when that already happened and how did you handle that? So we can talk about how to apply that again. All right, so overall, uh, my philosophy, working with students provides such a great opportunity for development and mentorship. And these learning domains are really helpful as a framework for guiding that work that you do with students. Again, it's listed as a peer education program, but it doesn't have to be with peer educators, just in whatever um, arena you are working directly with students. And then that's my email if you have any questions. I'm still sorry, but <laughs>
This is where we're standing, right? I would stand over that way a little bit. The camera's pointing this way. Like right here. Do you want water? Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah.